Hi, I'm Jeff Keith from Wheatstone, and I'm here to talk to you about some new findings in FM multipath control. Uh, there's kind of a story that goes behind this, and before I get really into it, we want to talk a little bit about FM stereo's history. It's been in use since 1961. It's been around a while. It uses double sideband suppressed carrier for the L-R. We did that because it made the stereo signal compatible with mono receivers. Unfortunately, the L-R being an AM signal is more fragile than the L plus R, which is the FM signal. Uh, we're experimenting with single sideband right now to see if it actually helps multipath or not. The jury's still out. Uh, lots of users are experimenting with it to see if it helps. Sometimes it seems to, sometimes it doesn't. One of the things I wanted to make clear is that when people talk about curing multipath, sometimes they don't really understand what multipath is. Multipath is actually a physical phenomenon and is caused when RF signals bounce off of reflecting objects such as buildings and mountains and multiple signals arrive at the, at the receiver at, the, at different times, but in, in the wrong phase. The only real cure for multipath isn't with processing and it's not with single sideband, it's removing the reflecting objects. So if you want to get rid of the buildings and mountains, there will be no multipath. When multipath is present, it can cause fluctuating RF levels in the receiver and stereo receivers respond to that by blending toward mono. And in a, especially in a mobile environment, that blending can be very annoying. Because so basically every three or four feet, you're, you're going through nulls and the audio is going in and out of stereo. And when that happens, uh, there's a very large audible effect because the receiver's trying to blend to mono, so it's blending the left and right channels together. And if the station is using stereo enhancement, you've got a very large L minus R, which is trying to go away whenever the receiver blends and that makes that blending even more noticeable. So one of the ways you can minimize those disturbances is to use stereo separation with moderation. Don't get crazy with it. Uh, if you're you know, looking at your air chain, make sure that you're not creating unintentional L minus R, which means uh, keeping good channel balance, inner channel phase should be good. Um, your transmission system, you should try to maintain symmetry in the transmission system. If you're on a combiner, uh, anything like that, sometimes that can be an issue. Uh, the last thing is really to intentionally modify only the L minus R signal. And I get strange looks sometimes when I say that, but what I really mean is to reduce the annoyance of blending in a stereo receiver, you need to manage the L minus R. And one of the ways we do that is we actually reduce it. In fact, some audio processors on the market have a feature that provides a static blend of three or six dB. And that feature's there because it actually works. It does seem to help the blend process in, in receivers. But the ideal method is an adaptive blend, not a static blend. And the way you would do that is you would make it a program controlled function. Um, but now we're talking about reducing stereo separation. And as broadcast engineers, we typically try to get the most stereo separation we can out of our facility. 90 dB, most exciters and stereo generators will do you know, quite good stereo separation, but consumer radios typically are only between 35, 45 dB on average. So that what that means is that listeners can't even hear all the stereo that we're trying to transmit. So how much stereo separation do we actually need? It turns out it's a lot less than 90 dB. In fact, it's not even 60 dB. And for a lot of people that aren't audiophiles, it's even less than 30 dB. But how do we know that? And for me, it actually started in 1998. I was working for an oldie station in Cleveland, Ohio. And a program director came to me one day and with his little portable Grundig radio and said, hey, uh, station XYZ across town is louder than we are. And he switched back and forth and it was true. They were louder than we were. But it happened at the time we were playing a Mamas and Papas record. And the ping pong stereo effects from back then put Mamas in one channel and Papas in the other. And so I ran across the room to the rack room and put a patch cord in to mono the signal, came back across into my office and said, how about now? And he said, oh, now we're louder than them. And that got me thinking. It's like, okay, so how do we fix this? How do I fix the mono loudness issue? Well, the first question is how much stereo separation can we reduce and still have a good stereo signal? And at the time, I didn't have a way to get that data. And I certainly didn't want to use myself because, I, you know, I, kind of an audio guy, so why, why do that? It was fortunate that in two weeks there was going to be a block party in my neighborhood, which meant that lots of people were going to be around, and most of them I was friends with. So I decided to use some of them as, te as test subjects. 
And it turned out I had 62 volunteers. There were 26 females, 36 males. Median age was about 33. And I asked them to bring two or three of their favorite CDs. And before they showed up, I built a little test jig. And what the test jig did was it gave them one knob that basically took a stereo signal and at zero it was mono and at, at full volume it was normal, normal stereo. And I asked them to start their CD, start with the control at zero, turn it up until they thought stereo was normal, and then stop. And at that point I would measure the control voltage for the VCA that was, that was reducing the stereo separation and log it. And after everybody was done and they all went home, I went back and I repeated the tests, setting the controls back to the same place and measuring the actual stereo separation with my Neutrik analyzer. And I was shocked at the numbers I was getting. In fact, the, the females uh, were very interesting. It turns out that most of them didn't need more than about 15 dB of stereo separation to think that the audio was full stereo. Now again, these are not audio files. These are normal, off the street, radio, you know, people who listen to the radio. The males' numbers were a little higher, and I kind of attribute that to maybe males are a little more aware of what stereo is. That's maybe a, I don't know. Um, overlying the two graphs, it's kind of interesting that they're, they're symmetrical but opposite. I have no idea what that means. Uh, it's just the way that the data graphed. But what this means is I had learned that I could reduce the stereo separation by a lot and electrically and not really affect the stereo experience. So I built a box that actually did that. We put it on the air and the first thing we noticed was that there was no difference in loudness between mono and stereo, but the stereo signal was still nice and loud. It was open and clean, everything else. A couple days later, people started coming to me and asked me what I did because they were noticing that the multipath was gone. And at first I thought, well, they're just thinking maybe it sounds better or whatever, but I had noticed too, but I hadn't said anything, that when I was driving the same path to and from work every day, I kind of had noticed it was gone too. And I was not expecting that. And as it turned out, the, the multipath in a lot of places in downtown Cleveland and in the suburbs was almost gone. And we thought, or well, maybe it's conditions or something, so we put the box in bypass and drove around for a couple of days. Multipath was back. So it turns out that this this box actually did two things. It managed the stereo separation so that when receivers blended from mono to stereo, the effects of multipath were reduced. It also evened out our mono loudness so we could play virtually any song we wanted and we didn't have to worry about people listening in the factories in, in Cleveland in mono, the volume going up and down. Years later, I discovered uh, a paper written by J.R. Stewart and he published it in 1996. And one of the graphs in that paper was very interesting, and it's data I wish I had had at the time, but I actually had to collect myself. And his, his graph shows that for a 50% apparent stereo image width, you only need a little over 10 dB of stereo separation electrically. And I was kind of happy when I found this paper because it kind of validated the research that I did, as crude as it was. Um, and you know, this is a, a paper called The Psychoacoustics of Multi-Channel Sound. This guy knows what he's doing. So I was very surprised that there was actually some, some, some supporting documentation for this. Uh, a couple of years later, Brian Beasley, uh, Case 6 STI, took, his gra took those graphs and tabulated the data, which is on this slide here, and kind of confirmed again that between 8, 9, 10 dB of stereo separation, you've got most of the stereo experience still intact. So what does that mean? It means that we can reduce the apparent um, incidences of multipath by managing the amount of L minus R signal that's actually being transmitted. And we've put that in all of our uh, FM stereo processors since 2008. It's uh, virtually undetectable in operation. It's been field proven in hundreds of installations to reduce the stereo blending annoyances that multipath would typically cause. Um, it, it actually works. Block diagram of kind of what we're doing uh, we're looking at some broadband width data, we're looking at some spectral data, and we're making decisions uh, in real time based on what the audio content actually is on what to do with the L minus R to make sure that those annoyances are minimized. Uh, summary, stereo blending behavior can be controlled. We can actually manage it at the transmit end. And controlling the blend behavior does minimize the audibility of blending in consumer receivers. And effective stereo width management is more than just reducing the L minus R. 
You can't just do it statically because then different receivers have different amounts of stereo separation and you get a variable experience for, for the listener. Both the L plus R and L minus R ratio in the program dynamics and spectral attributes have to be considered in this algorithm. Um, it's not a simple algorithm. It's not like a leveler or anything like that. It's a fairly intelligent uh, algorithm. It automatically adapts to changes in program content. So as the songs change and commercials change, the announcer comes and goes, the, the stereo, the L minus R is managed the way it should be. It does nothing to mono content. Mono content is completely untouched. And the algorithm is also windowed so that it doesn't chase the L minus R. It's actually measuring in real time. There's a, there's a decision window in which it makes its, its choices. Um, it's pretty much immune to imperfect phase matching between channels. So you don't have to be so concerned about your technical plant, although obviously maintaining it is, is a good thing. And it also provides intelligent stereo enhancement for material that's a little bit stereo shy. Because one of the things it's doing is it's managing the ratio of the L plus R and the L minus R. So if the L minus R is a little bit weak, it can actually bring it up. 